You so do. I'm gonna go on, I'm gonna go on a slight rant about guns here. No one likes it when you do that. Keep it in your pants. There is absolutely no reason to make a, a light infantry weapon that is in 308 full auto. It is pointless. Why not? Let's say you're gonna shoot at the, that right there on the car. Okay. By round three, you're up here. <laughs> okay. Because a powerful kick, you mean? Yes. Especially on a G3, which is roller delayed blowback, it is an incredibly violent recoil. What if you found a way to suppress the recoil? Then it would make sense, wouldn't it? Not really, because it's kind of hard unless your rifle is just really, really heavy. So you're saying any weapon with automatic fire that has recoil is bad, huh? No, 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 no just 308. Anytime I fired a G3 on full auto, I had to brace myself in like the weirdest way possible just to be able to get multiple rounds on target. Maybe it's, it's just because you're weak. The problem was they started making in in like the 1950s and 60s they started making all of these infantry weapons in 308 and then making them fall auto because they were like oh well, we'll just put it on a bipod and then we can use it in fall auto but the problem is nobody would ever put them on the bipods they would just shoot them on full auto and then wouldn't hit anything <laughs> The well, FAL is a little bit better, but that's only because its fire rate is higher, so you can kind of get one more round on target before it goes whap all the way into the sky. That's why I'm, I'm happy that it's semi-auto. <laughs> this gun looks really good, though. I do like the G3. You like the sleek design? You like the, the way they perform? I think they look cool. It's a Mossberg 590. Is that a good weapon or not? I personally am not a big fan of Mossberg 590. I like the Remington A70 better, but... What do you prefer about the Remington over the Mossberg? A uh, steel receiver as opposed to an aluminum receiver of the Mossberg. Is also, a, the Mossbergs feel kind of clanky. Is it significant difference or a slight difference? No, it's barely any difference. It's personal preference. So it's basically the same thing as a Remington, then? Kind of. The bolt is a little different and some of the other stuff. The barrel shroud is just a heat shield. So it prevents it from overheating? No, it keeps you from putting your hand on the barrel when it's real hot. Oh, so it's a barrel guard? Yeah, heat shield. I had a guy come in one day and was like, Hey, you got any of those shotguns with a cheese grater on them? <laughs> cheese grater? I'm like, what? <laughs> He's like, Yeah, you got a shotgun with a cheese grater on it. I'm like, What the hell are you talking about? Why would you put a cheese grater in a shotgun, you idiot? And then I realized that he wanted a shotgun with a heat shield. <laughs> was he using his rifle to carve up cheese? I don't know, probably. <laughs> Is that why he needed a new one? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, Mossberg 590. It's pretty cool. I like it. Did the Germans or the Russians invent it? No, it? It's an American shotgun. Oh, so it was made by Heckler and Weston? No, it was made by Mossberg. <laughs> Where are you even getting this from? <laughs> How vain do you have to be to name your rifle after yourself? It was Mossberg and Sons. This is the name of the company. Did they invent it in the year 590? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? Yes, they did then. No, they didn't invent it in the year 590. The Mossberg 590's been around since, I don't know, the 60s, 70s maybe? Why did they call it the Mossberg 1960s? I have no idea, because different companies name their guns different things. <laughs> Glocks are named after what patent number it is. That's why the Glock 17 is the 17. It has nothing to do with mag size. If anybody tells you that the Glock 17 is named that because it holds 17 rounds in the magazine, they don't know what they're talking about. No, I think we were right. The Mossberg 590, after 589 failed attempts at getting a patent... No! <laughs> You're wrong! <laughs> I'm not sure the difference is between a muzzle brake and a choke, sadly. A choke is basically a very shallow funnel that you put on the inside of the barrel that's going to compress the shot and the wadding before it leaves the barrel. So it pretty much makes the shotgun shell a slug of sorts? No, it just it just keeps it more tightly clustered together. Yeah, like a slug. No, because it's still going to open up the moment it leaves the barrel. Oh, so it's just a delayed explosion. What does the other thing do then? A muzzle brake just vents the exhaust gases out the side of the barrel. I knew it! Putting holes in your weapon makes it better! I no, it doesn't- Oh my god. <laughs> Technically, you're correct. Yes! <laughs> That's the best kind of correct. Technically, putting holes in the end of your barrel does mitigate recoil somewhat. <laughs> but not putting holes in it willy-nilly. You never know until you try. Oh my god, Mike. Behold, Mike! The Mateba Model 6 Unica! Never heard of that gun before. It's a revolver, and its name means you are unique. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was a gun's creator telling the gun that it was unique. <laughs> Fun fact about the Matiba Model 6 Unica, it fires out of the bottom cylinder. Oh, so not at the top cylinder like most revolvers? Yep, fires out of the bottom cylinder. Also, it's a semi-automatic revolver. So it's not necessarily good, it's just different for the sake of being different. Well, having it fire out of the bottom cylinder is a good thing because it reduces flip-up. Then why don't all of them do that? Uh, because it requires a lot more work and you gotta kind of move shit around a lot. So it's not necessarily better. Not necessarily. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a revolver that uses gas pressure of the cartridge firing to cock the hammer back, so it fires on single action every shot. Why would a six-shot single action revolver be semi-automatic? It just cocks the hammer back every time. Oh, so you don't have to recock it? Yes, yeah, so you don't have to pull the hammer back every single time. Oh, well, that sounds great. Why don't all revolvers do that? Because uh, it's really complicated. It's just, it's a lot of extra work and a lot of extra parts to put into a gun, so mm. it didn't really catch on. Also, it looks weird. Weird is cool. If you want a Matiba, you pretty much just have to get a Chiapa Rhino because Matibas are almost impossible to find. I've never and they get a premium. I believe it. I've never even heard of the Matiba. I think its biggest claim to fame is that it was in the Ghost in the Shell movie from like the 1980s. Ah, so a whole 12 people saw it. Wow, man. <laughs> Way to just completely crap on my childhood. <laughs> Ah, oh, the Mataba. Yes, that weapon was featured in episode 14 of The Snorks. <laughs> what new weapon are you using now? This is the Beretta M92FS. Isn't that the standard issue police weapon? Uh, no, standard issue, it was the- Ah! Stop resisting! Gun, gun! I'm gonna go through ammo for this thing pretty quick, I think. Yeah, you keep spraying it like that. Well, it takes a lot of bolts to take one of those things down. You ever try to kill a plant with a gun? It's not very effective. <laughs> Next time you try to weed your front lawn, try using a pistol to do it. The entire time I was in the military, I was like, Man, the M9's a piece of garbage. Why would anybody use this hunk of junk? And then when I got out of the military, I was like, Man, the M9's awesome. I love this handgun. Maybe that's not a testament to the weapon's strength. I, I think the main problem is that in the military, it's a military-issued one. So it's not exactly well-made. And also, hmm, that's suspicious. It's not exactly well made. It's used by soldiers who beat the crap out of it. It's all old parts. Also, I, uh, I feel like the M9 is a great civilian handgun, but a terrible, oh my god, I'm not proving my point here, combat handgun. It's got too many parts. Good lord. What is happening? Die! 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 Help! Help! Help me! So it's not only a bad herbicide, but a bad pesticide as well. Oh, what are you using now? This is the AN-94. They put pulleys in it so that it, it fires one round, then the barrel starts recoiling backwards, and then it fires the second round. So you get two rounds firing out of it before the recoil impulses hit the shooter. Did they invent that before gas pistons were a thing? It was an attempt to increase the hit probability of... Hang on. The hit probability of the average soldier. Did it but, work? Did they did they succeed? Yeah, except that the gun is incredibly complicated and very expensive. So it was adopted by the Russian military for about a day, and then it wasn't. Yeah, I like the rear sight on the AN-94. It's cool. It looks like it's lopsided. Uh, it is. It's kind of off to the side, but you rotate this little piece right there to whatever range you're aiming at. Oh, you hold it like a gangsta sideways to the no, sight it's the, straight it's, side up? No, it's... The correct way, it's just the sight is just there. It, look at it! I can see it! It's crooked! It's not crooked! I'm looking through this top part of it right here, and then it's got it's got an angle like that. So when you rotate it, it's always in the correct position. Yes, it's weird. It's a weird gun. That's why I grabbed it, because it's weird. Weird doesn't mean useful. Weird doesn't mean it's good. Do you have a lot of ammo that you want to get rid of quickly? Do you have a bunch of enemies that you want to throw lead at as fast as humanly possible? Do you hate that guy over there and you want him to be just absolutely suppressed for the next three and a half minutes? Then buy the PKM light machine gun. Standing for words in Russian that I don't understand, PKM is an acronym. Using a long stroke gas operating system with an open bolt assembly, the PKM is capable of throwing large amounts of ammunition at approximately anywhere from 650 all the way up to 800 rounds per minute. Point the barrel at the thing you want to die, squeeze the trigger, and death comes out. Yes, pretty much. Would you, you drop that styrog in the water? I dropped it and I don't know where it went. Oh no. Ah, oh, it's too bad. It's, I, uh... I can't talk about it anymore if I don't have a visual aid. Yeah, you could just talk about how much you love the Matsuba again. Yep, that is a Mauser broom handle. Also known as the Type 22, yes. You, the... you, you mentioned that the Chinese name all their weapons Type Number. Yeah, they do, and I don't know what the Chinese nomenclature for this pistol is, so... I thought it was Type 22, but maybe I'm getting my types confused. I don't know, there's so many. I can't remember the names of all of them. They used it in World War I, and it was outdated in World War I. 
Uh, what's not great about it? In 1914, mm -hmm. this pistol was outdated. What made it outdated? The fact that it only holds, what, 12 shots? The real one holds, I think, 10 rounds. It's an internal magazine that you cannot remove. You have to load it with stripper clips. Wait, what? You... You... <laughs> oh, that sounds terrible! So then you have to take a stripper clip, which is just a long piece of metal with a bunch of bullets in it, and then push all the bullets down into the magazine with your thumb. Mm -hmm. And if you do it wrong, the bolt will close on your thumb. <laughs> sounds so fun! I like the BAR. I'm not a big fan of this specific model. I think this is... Uh, I think this is the BAR A2, technically, and I'm not a big fan of the A2. What's I the difference? Like so the original BAR was substantially lighter. It had a bipod, but the bipod was removable. On the A2, they made the bipod non-removable, and it's freaking heavy. They also put a magazine adapter on it, which is also heavy. There you go. See that little thing on the top of it? The little <laughs> curved portion that's kind of sticking in the wrong direction? Mm -hmm. That's the safety. That's a weird way to have a safety. Yeah. The safety mechanism literally is the dust cover that you close it, and it keeps things from getting in there, and it also keeps the bolt from moving forwards. Neat. Also, there's no charging handle on this submachine gun. You just shove your finger into the ejection port and pull the bolt back. You don't need to charge it. It's not an energy weapon. Loading handle, Mike. <laughs> you want to debate guns for a while with someone who doesn't know anything about guns? Or you want to do some bounty hunting? Fine, let's do some bounty hunting. <laughs> Tell me about the Steyr Aug before you kill all of them. Well, the Steyr Aug, uh, Aug is technically an acronym for uh, Army Universal Gewehr. And it was first adopted by the Austrian military in 1977, so its original name was the STG-77, which stands for Sturmgewehr 77. Yes, it's a very good rifle. It was very futuristic at the time of its release. But it's not so much anymore. It does look... It's still a pretty advanced automatic rifle. The Styrog has what's called a progressive trigger, at least on the military models. Ah, so it's very open towards gay marriage. Also, yes, but the trigger, when you pull it back a little bit until it clicks the first time, that's when it fires single shot. But if you pull it back all the way, it fires fully automatic. Another interesting fact about the Steyr Aug is that it is used by both the Austrians and the Australians. So now it doesn't matter if you get those two confused. Yes, exactly. The ones that's used by the Australians is technically called the Austire, though. The, the Steyr Aug was the first bullpup to be adopted by a military. Well, it was the first bullpup to be widely adopted by a military. I think technically there was one before that, but it doesn't really count because it was adopted by Britain for about... Five minutes and then wasn't adopted anymore. <laughs> the first time I fired a Styrog, it was one of the full auto ones, and the Austrians didn't tell me about the progressive trigger for it. <laughs> Sorry, Australians. The Australians didn't tell me about the progressive trigger for it. So I'm just kneeling down on the firing range. I get behind this thing. I get it all scoped up, and I pull the trigger. I go, man, this trigger's really heavy. And I jerk it all the way back, and it goes... <laughs> then they laughed at me. So yeah, the Styrog is my favorite bullpup. Other than a FAMAS, which you basically cannot get a FAMAS in the United States. There's, I think, a, a total of maybe 400 that exist in the U.S. Wait, only 400 FAMASs? Yeah, there's only like 400 that exist. Why not more? So the FAMAS was imported for a very short period of time before there was a ban on importing weapons. Mm. So there's only like 400 semi-automatic FAMASs that exist in the U.S. So that must be a collector's treasure, huh? Yes, they contract a premium. $20,000. Wow. You can't legally purchase them outside of the ones that are already here? No, you can't. Because you the ones that were imported are the only ones that are ever going to be imported. <laughs> God, I gotta get a new barrel for this thing. This rifling is just mad fucked. You couldn't just zero it in, huh? No, it's got terrible rifling on it. Maybe you should keep better care of it. Oh, yeah, I'll just repair the rifling on my barrel, Mike. <laughs> You make it sound like that's a difficult thing to do, but I have no idea. That That's an impossible thing. I don't, do we have access to a hammer forge, Mike? Where's your hammer forge? Uh, Why don't you just knock out a new barrel for your gun? Got a workbench over here. It's close enough. Does that look like a hammer forge to you? Well, maybe the stove could function as a hammer forge. That looks like an Uzi to me. Israeli military industry's Uzi. Watch out. Uzi is one of the better submachine guns. A lot of different militaries actually ended up adopting it. I think the U.S. had it for a while. Have you which... fired a Uzi before? I have. D did you enjoy the experience? It's all right. When I hear submachine gun, I think at least 50 rounds in the clip. The sub in submachine gun is actually indicative of the caliber. 
sub-caliber weapon, so mm. smaller than rifle caliber. Oh! Speaking of submachine guns that were available around the same time, I just found a Sten gun. My name's Stan, here's my gun. So this is one of the other <laughs> This is one of the other submachine guns that was widely available around the time of the Uzi. Is the magazine in there sideways? Yes it is. The magazine pokes out of the side. It's not a handguard. It's not a thing you're supposed to grip. Um, most soldiers would just hold on to the magazine well. Yeah! Got it. The only submachine guns that were, again, widely available were things like the MP-18 and the Thompson submachine gun. Submachine guns that were quite large, pretty dang heavy, and expensive to manufacture because it required a lot of machining. The Sten gun, by comparison, is made... Basically out of a tube with a couple <laughs> holes cut into it, a barrel, and then pressed pieces of sheet metal. It's basically a pipe gun. At the time they were making these things, they could probably knock out about five of them in an hour. Nice! They could just slam these things together incredibly fast. The only complaint people had about them is there, if you're carrying one on a sling, there's really no good way to carry it. The sights bang into your stomach. And also it doesn't want to sit like that, so it keeps trying to roll over. Mm -hmm. If you carry it the other direction... The charging handle slams into your stomach. And if you carry it with the magazine pointing up, the trigger jams into your stomach. So there's no good way to carry this submachine gun. And that's why it fell out of service and was replaced by the M16. No, it fell out of service because machine guns like the Uzi started coming about. And while this thing is a really good, incredibly cheap submachine gun that you can knock out thousands of them very quickly, it isn't that accurate. You can still find these things damn near everywhere. I found tons of them when I was in Iraq. Ones that were built in like the 40s and still were being used. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. I had one that was turned into me that had a built-in suppressor. Built? How do you make a built-in suppressor? Uh, basically, you drill a bunch of holes in the barrel and you add a suppressor to the end of it. I had one that had been camouflage painted, had an integral suppressor, and somebody had bolted a rail to the top and attached a laser sight to it. A and laser were, sight on a, on a pistol that's 80 years old. Yeah, on a submachine gun. When, when you were taking inventory of these weapons, did you have to mark down details like that on the notes page? Nope, I just remembered that. And they actually made, I think, four or five different stocks. What stock? This. It looks like someone jammed a hanger in there. Yeah, it's pretty much just a piece of wire. It was made to be cheap. Like yeah. I said, this gun was made to be cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Task accomplished, it's I guess. It's an incredibly simple, cheap gun that was designed to arm Britain soldiers with some type of submachine gun <laughs> that didn't cost... At the time, one Thompson submachine gun cost as much as about ten of these. This is a really good option. It would be a better option if it were more accurate. Doesn't really matter. Submachine guns are designed to be used at about 50 yards, and that's it. They have spray and pray guns. Pretty much. I have shot both a Sten gun and an Uzi. If I, if I was going to be armed with one of these two submachine guns, I think I'd probably take the Sten gun. You said that the Sten gun had only 40 moving parts, roughly, right? It's well, like 40 parts total. There's barely any. That sounds like easy maintenance to me. Yeah, it's incredibly easy to maintain. No joke, if the recoil spring breaks on a Sten gun, you probably can go find a screen door and rip the spring off of that and shove it into the gun and it'll work. Didn't you do that? You took a pencil spring or something? I put like a mechanical pen spring in a Walther P38. <laughs> and it worked just as good, huh? Yeah, it worked fine. <laughs> yeah, that'll hold it over until I can get a new spring. It's really good at filling the enemies with hot lead. <laughs> ah! Ooh! Ooh! Ooh, what you got? What you got here? What you got? Let me turn you over and take a look at this thing. An L96A1! Are you fucking kidding me? Never heard of that one. L96A1! <laughs> That's got a nice scope on it, I see. <laughs> yes, it does have a nice scope on it. Most people are going to know this thing as the Accuracy International Op. Most people wouldn't recognize it in this kind of view, but yes. Oh, hello. Okay, just going to use this gun on him. Well, they were hostile. <laughs> they didn't seem hostile until you shot them in the throat. Wow, I suck with sniper rifles. There you there go. There you go. You like that? <sighs> what? Is there a There's another one. Oh, he's got an op too. This is going to go right in your ear. <laughs> you waste them! Yeah! Accuracy International, the company that designed this rifle, mm. was effectively three guys in a shed. <laughs> and they were like, why don't we submit this rifle that we built to the British military rifle trials for a new sniper <laughs> rifle? So they did it. They didn't expect to win. 
It won handily, and they were like, oh crap, now we gotta build a bunch of these things. So when the British military sent some requisitions lieutenants out to their shop, <laughs> to his garage, they rented a large shop and then took their entire inventory of rifles they had produced up until that point. And there's only three people that worked for this company at the time. So when the requisitions officers showed up, they were like, well, where is everybody? Oh, they're out to lunch. It'll be fine. Um, <laughs> Why are we in a two-stall garage? The rest of the house is out for lunch, too. It'll be back in a moment. Well, no, they had rented out for a day an actual <laughs> workshop. Put it, had all these workbenches in it, put all the rifles on it in different states. So they showed up, and the requisitions officers were happy. They're like, hey, this looks like a really good operation you guys got going here. Let's go out to lunch. So they went out and got lunch. And then while they were out at lunch, the requisitions officers were like, yeah, this was really more of a formality. We just wanted to make sure you weren't three guys in a shed. And they're just like... <laughs> Oh my god, we're in so much trouble! <laughs> anyway, it ended up getting adopted, and it's a really, really good rifle. Have you fired one of these guns? I have fired one of these guns. Come on! Really? If it's any World War II gun, they were probably all over the place in Iraq. So it's the, the PPSH-41. It's a Russian submachine gun. These guns we've been picking up that you've been spouting about... They were all used by the Allies in World War II? Uh, yes. So far, we have not found any German World War II submachine guns, which would be the MP38. I think it's going to be the only one. Wait, is that the only weapon the Nazis had? What no, about? no, they had tons of other ones. Just the MP38 is like the only submachine gun they technically uh, had. Okay. This one does eject all the shell casings out of the top of it. Shoots them up? Yeah, the shell casings just pop straight out the top of it. Into your line of sight? Uh, you don't really notice them when you're shooting it. You do notice them when they come raining back down from the sky and go down the shirt collar. Yeah, seems like a terrible design. You say people like these guns. That's one of the primary <laughs> downsides of it is that that happens. People would take these guns, fire them sideways gangsta style, and then shoot their comrades with the shrapnel. You're actually not wrong because one of the standard practices for these things was to hold it at 25 or 45 degree angle. Well, yeah, if in you your shoulder, so it goes it, and spits the shell casings. If away. you design the sh the shell casings to eject straight up, then it just makes sense. Well, the reason they eject they have it eject the shell casings straight up is because it's an ease of manufacturing. Hey, should we manufacture a gun that doesn't shoot hot shell casings down the soldiers' backs? We could, but this is so much cheaper. There was the Sten gun, which was like the British one. And then there was an Australian one, which was the Owen submachine gun, I believe. The Emu Slayer. The Owen gun is real weird. How so? Uh, so you know how you thought it was weird the magazine sticks out of this one? Does the magazine stick straight out the top of it? You got it! Come on, I was joking! <laughs> you're serious! Yes, the Owen gun has the magazine sticking straight out of the top. You're sure you're not making an Australian joke about how the magazine is upside down? Yes, the magazine sticks straight out of the top. I know it is not an Australian joke. There's actually a good reason for doing that. A lot of- Because um, the gravity flows up? The reason for doing that is because you don't have to have a super strong magazine spring. Because gravity actually aids in feeding the rounds. Then why don't they all do that? Uh, because it means you have to have your sights offset to the side of it. Oh, which yes. Which is kind of a pain in the ass. Yeah, now that you mention it, it does sound stupid that way. <laughs> You're stupid. Shut up. You don't know. I'm not the one putting a magazine in my line of sight so I can't see. <laughs> what if you put crosshairs in the bottom of the magazine? So you could just use it. <laughs> you'd, have you know, to, you'd have to recite it every time you had to reload. You joke about that, but there's actually a couple pistols that literally just have crosshairs painted on the back of the gun, and you're just supposed to put the back of the pistol on top of the center of the target and hope that you're going to hit it. What is this bullshit? <laughs> the fuck is this thing? Uh, <laughs> you're not familiar with it? No. <laughs> Probably because they made it at home. It's a bathtub moonshine kind of gun. God, yeah, it looks like it was made at home. Well, except the front sight and rear sight actually look usable. Mm. And there's actually some really nice knurling on the back of that end cap. Knurling? Knurling. Knurling's fun and expensive. So this is a very expensive homemade submachine gun. <laughs> so instead of writing overpressure ammunition on the back of every single bullet, they just do a little plus and the B. Because then, at a glance, you can tell what kind of ammunition you have. What if it's under pressure? Is it negative P then? No, then it's just ammunition. <laughs> um, excuse me! Is it G36 time? I believe it's G36 time. It's G36 time, Mike. Made by Heckler, Heckler and Coke, or Heckler and Koch, however the hell you want to pronounce it. I say Koch. Everyone says Koch. It doesn't matter. Yeah, pronounce it however the hell you want. You're an American. 
It's a 5.56 select fire weapon system. Made primarily of polymer, which is interesting and futuristic. Mm-hmm. Stock folds off to the side. It's one of the first really modular weapons that was adopted by a military. So on the magazine, you see those two little circles that are right there? Yes. Those are actually locking lugs, so you can just lock a bunch of magazines together. <laughs> just stack them like Jenga pieces one after the other? Yeah, pretty much. They work pretty well. H&K did kind of get in trouble recently. Some of the trunnions on the guns weren't exactly put together properly. I so don't know what a trunnion is. The piece of metal that the barrel locks into mm. on the inside of the gun. Uh, turned out some of them were kind of crappy. So they had a tendency to start having wandering zeros, which means that every time you would zero it, the zero would completely change and it would start shooting all over the place. Have you fired one of these? I have never fired a full auto version, no. But I have (laughs) fired a civilian version. You can't get an actual G36 in the U.S. because apparently H&K doesn't think that we're German enough to be allowed to own them. Mm -hmm. So they imported this bastardized version of it that's called the HK SL8. Which is atrocious. Even more so than this gun, huh? These guns are great. You just finished telling me how they were not that great because of the that parts. That was kind of a problem for the military one, and it, they were old at that time. It, Ignoring all of the defects, these guns the are great. On the whole, this gun worked amazingly well. <laughs> for some reason, they made it so that the SL-8 takes magazines that look like G36 magazines, but the G36 magazine will not go into it. Because they converted it to a single stack magazine. Okay. So the magazines are not interchangeable. Most of the parts aren't interchangeable. It's got a weird, stupid thumbhole stock that makes it look absolutely asinine. The barrel is super long. doesn't have a flash hider on it. If this gun is so great, how come I've never heard of it before? Because you're not interested in guns in any way, shape, or form. I'm going to use this one. It looks kind of like the M16. No, this is the Fabrique Nationale FNC, which stands for Fabrique Nationale Carbine. So, yeah, it's kind of redundant in that it's called the Fabrique Nationale Fabrique Nationale Carbine. The FNC is based on the AR-18, which is a piston-driven version of an AR-15. A lot of the stuff on the inside of it is a little bit different. They were very well received. They worked well. The intended purpose of this was actually to replace the FAL. Didn't really work for that. Initial ones had problems with the stock falling off. <laughs> it's a big bit of a problem there, also yeah. Also, the handguard falling off. Also, it was made out of paper and salt and disintegrated if it touched water. Once they got those problems worked out, this was an amazing gun. <laughs> I want an FNC, but I want the AK-5C handguard on it. You know what I'm talking about? No, absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> ah, a drum mag in the Tommy gun. Actually, it's not a drum mag, is it? No, we've discussed this, and it is technically a drum mag, but... Whip. <laughs> wiggle, wiggle. <laughs> We've discussed this. It's a it's an AM one eighty. Wiggle wiggle. Is that how you clear a jam on a atomic yeah. gun? Really? You just wiggle it? No. <laughs> uh, let's go turn this evidence in. Wiggle wiggle. <laughs> and this one. Come on, come back, come back. Was that a Makarov? Were you shooting me with a Makarov? I I don't know how I guessed it that quickly. <laughs> Tell me about the Makarov. It's a Russian gun, isn't it? I can't tell you right now. I'm busy killing. Come on. That's never stopped you before. The Makarov is a 9mm Russian pistol, but it's in a different 9mm caliber. Wait, there's different 9mm? Yes. The Makarov is in 9x18 Makarov, not 9x19 Parabellum, which is the normal 9mm round. Come on, really? Yes, there's also 9x21... Um, there's 9mm Largo. There are so many different kinds of ammo. Can you standardize slightly, please? Well, it's shorter by 1mm? Excuse me. (laughs) Wow! That dropped him fast! It's kind of based on the Walther PPK pistol. It looks similar, and it's the same operating principle. It's just a straight blowback pistol. It's nothing fancy. The barrel's pinned in place, which means that this pistol has a lot more recoil than you think it's going to. It lets you know you're shooting it. I did find another gun. It's the Colt 1911. Ah, the most reliable firearm on the market. I've gone over the 1911 before. You've called it the most unreliable gun you've ever used. I like joking about that. Uh, It's not really that unreliable. No, they work just fine. I just like giving 1911 owners a bunch of shit (laughs) because my two world wars and 45 ACP because they don't make a 46. (laughs) Hello. Hallway. True to Kaisar. True, True to Ka- Different gun. 
Give us that gun! Oh, it's a Taurus! Ugh. You, I take it you don't like guns that are oh, named after constellations? Oh, uh, it's a Taurus Raging Bull! Oh, it's a garbage gun! Is it, though? Oh, uh, Taurus guns are, like, really bad quality. Really? Yeah, they're not great. Well, look, you, I'm sure you could put the what barrel. What the? <laughs> okay, I'm more interested in what you have. I'm gonna kill you with this Taurus Raging Bull real quick. Yeah, Taurus basically makes all of their money copying other ones. Like, this is pretty much a Smith & Wesson revolver, only they don't do a very good job of putting them together. They pretty much exclusively copy Smith & Wesson or Beretta, uh, and that's it. They still get the job done, though, don't they? I mean, yeah, it'll still work. It's just not good. Usually the triggers are kind of crap. The finish is really awful. They break a lot. So we'll just put this into that garbage there. And what the fuck is this thing? <laughs> it's called a duplet. I don't know what the hell a duplet is. What is a duplet? Uh, you tell me. You're the gun expert. <laughs> AK-47, my friend! Everybody knows about that gun. Everybody knows what an AK-47 is. Everybody in the, on the eastern side of the world uses that gun. Pretty much. Or an AK-74, or some variant of it. I know what an AK is, you know what an AK is, we all know what an AK is. It shoots a big bullet. It works pretty well. It doesn't shoot a huge bullet. It's a decent sized round. The thing I know about the AK is that it, you could throw it around in the mud and it'd keep on firing. That's actually not true. The AK is an amazing gun to give to people who have no idea how to maintain weapons. And it doesn't matter if it's got oil in it. It doesn't matter if it's clean. It will just work. Had enough? The problem is... It's not very precise. Is no, it's, it's still... It's decently accurate for a rifle. It's designed... The AK was designed to work from 0 to 300 meters. Hmm. And that's pretty much it. The problem is, when you turn the safety off, there is that massive hole in the side of it. The dirt and debris and everything can just get jammed right in the side of there. So you want to keep the safety on as much as possible. Even then, the problem is on AK-47s, and this is the thing everybody goes on and on and on about is, but it's got loose tolerances so dirt can just go into it. It's got loose tolerances, which means dirt gets into it, and then the dirt makes it not work. If you fill the inside of an AK-47 up with dirt, it doesn't work anymore. It was designed to be a mass-produced rifle, to be made very cheap, and do its job. Does and it do its job, it sir? It does its job very well. Do you have a pink or jackhammer? I'm not even gonna pick that up. Are you not gonna pick it up because you hate that gun? I'm not gonna pick it up because it's not a real gun and it doesn't actually exist. <laughs> and everybody insists on putting it in video games like it's some kind of mythical god shotgun. It's an MP412 Rex. I've never heard of it. It's a Russian revolver. It's a Russian top rake revolver. I know nothing about it because you can't get them in the US. I've never handled one. I know nothing about them. I don't know if they're good or bad or what. I don't know why this specific one looks like the entire thing was dipped in chrome because the grip is shiny mm. and it shouldn't be. Well, maybe this Emmett Curry guy just likes his fancy revolvers. Maybe he does. What was that other thing? <laughs> I don't know what you mean. Surely it wasn't a gun called an AS Val. You give it to me right now! I don't even know what this thing is. Give it, give it. <laughs> All right, fine. I don't even know what an AS Val is. How long have you had this? Uh, uh when did we kill Sergio? Oh my god, man! <laughs> and you didn't think to tell me. What? It's not like it's a good weapon or anything. Oh my god, it's one of my favorite guns of all time. I've never, you've never mentioned this to me before. The AS Val is, oh my god, I... <laughs> I can't even I can't even deal with you right now. I've never you've never mentioned it before ever. The AS Val is amazing. It's in 9x39. Oh, so they made a new kind of ammo for it. That's great. Cause you know, I love having 10,000 kinds of ammo that's completely incompatible. The the whole point of 9x39 is that it's a subsonic armor piercing bullet. You slap a big ass suppressor on the front of this thing, and now you have a subsonic suppressed Fully automatic gun. I didn't know it was suppressed. Yes, it, it makes no noise. No? It just ticks at you. Oh, well, if we ever have a stealth mission, this will be useful. I can't believe you didn't tell me you had this thing. Again, I didn't know you'd care. From now on, can you just assume that if you find a gun, I'll probably <laughs> care? And then I'll tell you afterwards. I thought we already found all the guns you liked. I will not interrupt you for telling me that you found a new <laughs> gun. 
so there's a couple different versions of this gun. Mm. There is the initial version, which was the VSS Ventores. Then the next one that came out was Why is there a landmine? <laughs> Ow! So, VSS Ventores was first. AS Val, which is this one, was the second version. Technically, there's a third version, which is called the SR3M. Doesn't have an integral suppressor, it just has a screw on suppressor. Mm. This one, the suppressor, is part of the gun. You actually are not supposed to shoot it without a suppressor on it. But what does this mean for me, somebody who knows nothing about guns? <laughs> ah, God! Nice work, Mike. <laughs> so let's see. We found the Colt Pocket 1849, which is this thing. It's a percussion cap revolver. <laughs> All right. It sounds a little weak, and it looks kind of silly. Yes, it's a black powder <laughs> revolver. What? Did you just remove that? Why wouldn't you just load the six things in there with the spit? Why do you remove that? Um, okay, so this is a black powder revolver. Which means, um, when you want to reload it, you either have to remove the entire cylinder or hold the gun at a weird angle and pour the powder into each one of the cylinders. Oh my lord. It's and then put a ball into it and then jam the ball down in there. It's a six-shooter blunderbuss. Yeah, it, it's a black powder muzzle loader. <laughs> it's a musket with six shots. Yes! <laughs> If you're shooting revolvers that are black powder like this one, just smear a little bit of Crisco across the top of it. Um, I'm not even joking. To, oh, to prevent the sun from blinding you? No, I meant the face of the cylinder oh. where the bullets come out of. Mm -hmm. When you fire this, they don't accidentally chain fire and all go off at the same time. Oh! I <laughs> because that is something that could potentially happen. <laughs> and uh, because the barrel isn't in front of the bullet, it would just explode in your hand. Yes. That's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. AK-971 is a very interesting gun. Ooh, fast firing rate! Me so horny! <laughs> Boy, you immediately forgot about that Val gun, huh? Makes me feel so dirty just holding this thing! So the AK-971 is an experimental weapon that the Russian military tested out that uses a weird counterweight mechanism inside it. The counterweight moves in the opposite direction the bolt is moving. So, it has a really high firing rate, but it just kind of pushes into your shoulder instead of trying to climb on you. Mmm, so it absorbs recoil and throws it into your shoulder? Any gun is going to recoil. This one doesn't have a whole lot. It just doesn't want to climb. It just basically wants to push straight backwards. Uh-huh. It shoots a lot of bullets real fast! What do you say? Accuracy by volume of fire? That's pretty much what the AEK-971 does. <laughs> All right. Was that also given to soldiers who were incompetent? No, it was an experimental weapon. The Russian military adopted it, but not really. So they didn't make a whole lot of them? So no, not really. So There's... it's kind of a mythical gun, like the Pancor Jackhammer, is what you're saying? No, because the Pancor Jackhammer, there is only one of. You don't know that. They could, ha they could have some hiding. They could have some that you don't know about. Uh-huh. That they didn't make public. Uh-huh. <laughs> what?! You don't know for certain there I is- I do know for certain there is one! If there is one that exists, people can look at the schematics and make a duplicate of it, so there could be two! Cause you can't just make a fully automatic gun, you have to have the right licensing to do it! You're saying I can't legally make it, I'm saying I could disregard the legality and make a clone of it. It also would be complete shit, and it wouldn't actually be a Pancor jackhammer, it would be a gun made in a garage by some moron that doesn't know how to put a gun together. They'll call it the Pancor Jack Glamour. They'll call it a Pancor piece of shit. <laughs> Including the Pancor jackhammer. Yeah, oh boy. God, what a fucking piece of junk this gun is. It looks kind of futuristic. No, it doesn't. It looks like garbage. It's kind of cool. And it's got so many holes in it! You know, why don't you use this gun since you love it so much? And then it can jam on you every two seconds because they built one of it and it's a prototype <laughs> and it sucks. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's got this stupid clockwork drum mechanism that you have to pull out in order to replace the ammo compartment. Oh, God! You really don't like it, huh? I don't like it because it's an experimental weapon that they designed one firing version of. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work. It looks like something somebody drew in third grade math class when they were supposed to be paying attention. <laughs> Look at this piece of crap! <laughs> The AKS-74U, which was designed in 1974 in the month of October. October. <laughs> oh, God, now I get it. Okay. 
This goofy little thing right there on the end of it. Ah, you're talking about the barrel. The the cone on the end of it. The flash actually, hider. Yeah, it's a flash hider and it also increases back pressure so the rifle will cycle properly. Also, the top cover is hinged so you can't lose it anymore. <laughs> um, and it has this side folding wire stock. It's got a hole in it which means it's light and useful. No, that hole is part of the side folding mechanism. I'm talking about the hole in the stock. This is a giant hole in the stock. There's not a lot of metal. What there. is with you in wanting to put holes in things? Holes make things cool. No, they don't. Whoa, that's a tiny shotgun. Give me your tiny shotgun, please. Oh, that's a Remington A70. That's way better than this shitty Mossberg 500 I have. Really? Oh, we killed him. Ah, uh, he got caught mid-reload. That's why you don't bring a revolver to an autoloader fight. <laughs> See, look. It's empty. Oh, no. What do I do? And then I came up and was like... <laughs> pew, pew, pew. <laughs> pew, pew, pew. Yeah, Remington 870. I can't believe you would give up your Mossberg in any capacity. I like the Remington 870 better than the Mossberg. I like the Remington 870 better because the older ones are better put together. They're more well-made. Ah, built to last, you say? Older ones are really well put together. They run smooth. They're very nice pump-action shotguns. By the looks of it, this one is an older one because it's a blued finish and not parkerized. There is a lot of hate between people who use the Remington 870 and people who use the Mossberg 500. I didn't realize there was a rivalry, like the Montagues and the Capulets. No, more like Ford and Chevy owners. I see. They have absolutely no proof that either one of the guns is better, and yet they will yell at each other about how, Well, my Ford's better than your Chevy! Oh, yeah, Ford! More like, fix it again, Tony! That's just Fiat, you dumbass! <laughs> so are you going to put a decal on your Remington there of Calvin pissing out a Mossberg? Sure, why not? I, I would be lying if I said I had never seen a decal of Calvin peeing on a gun logo. Yeah, I've sadly seen that before, which is a real shame. Bill Watterson didn't want his characters to be used like that. There really isn't much difference between the Mossberg 500 and the Remington 870. They're both relatively inexpensive pump-action shotguns. They they're, both work fine. They're both inferior to the Pancor Jackhammer in theory. I have to say in theory because everyone knows the Pancor Jackhammer is not a real weapon yet. But maybe one day, if we all dream hard enough, it could be. <laughs> so there's a second Remington 870 in this game? Yeah, the hunting shotgun is just a Remington 870. So or... Maybe it's based off a of Winchester Model 12. Mm. I can't prove that because the Model 12 does look similar to the Remington 870. I think it is based on the Winchester, yes. Now that you mention it, with my vast knowledge of guns. Oh my god, Mike. Oh god, a pink or jackhammer. He was. He was <laughs> yeah. That's what you get for using a gun that doesn't exist. You said it didn't exist, but there's already two of them. We just found them all. Oh my god. It's because somebody... Somebody made copies. I told you they did. You didn't believe me. But it's not a Pancor jackhammer. It's shotgun made by Raider. With the exact same specifications as a Pancor jackhammer. <sighs> ah, yes. The Pancor jackhammer has a firing rate of a fucking lot and kills enemy with gusto. I hate you. It was invented by the cyborg Russians back in 2027. I hate you. And everybody knows that it's got a flash-powered muzzle hider. Yes, very effective at You're killing. You're just saying words. You're just saying <laughs> words. You're pissing me off.